I think it was a really interesting conversation contrasting three different viewpoints from hospital operations, ambulatory operations, and then kind of overall system operations. And one of the things I found fascinating was just how important blocking and tackling is to driving care delivery innovation. I think we often think about innovation and transformation as big bang things. Somebody discovers something and each of the panelists talked about just kind of the slow progression of culture change, embedding technology into workflow, and then using that to allow care delivery transformation at scale across large enterprises. So a little bit more of a kind of slow and steady transformation with a clear vision in mind, rather than, you know, kind of breakthrough innovation. Uh, I thought that was a fascinating conversation to have with the group. I think the challenge on primary care, and I think it's a really important challenge, is not just that there aren't enough primary care providers or primary care physicians, it's that there isn't enough primary care. And I think part of the challenge is we have largely a fee-for-service based reimbursement model. You know, how much can you cover your practice overhead by billing level two and level three office visits that reimburse you know, $100 each? That's a challenging model. The population health oriented payment models can be better for that, you know, capitation or other types of advanced payment models. But fundamentally, I think we need to actually re-architect how we think about primary care, not just being a primary care physician and a patient, but a primary care model and a patient. And I think this gets to the crux of care delivery transformation. If we were to sub-segment the population and say, and I'll use myself as an example, I'm relatively young, relatively healthy, very, very busy, and the primary care model that I need needs to be heavily virtual, needs to allow for asynchronous communication where I can send a little chat message in and get a response whenever it's convenient for my provider who happens to be an NP, which makes sense given my health profile. She has access to a physician if she needs it. Uh, but most of what I need to have dealt with, with a little bit of you know, kind of self-navigation and education, and being generally tech savvy, I can do through an asynchronous model with a video visit when needed and an in-person visit or lab draws when needed. And that's very different than my mother-in-law who lives with us and we live in the same building as my primary care office, but she doesn't go there. She's almost 80 years old. She has two chronic diseases and a rare hematological disorder. And her primary care provider needs to be a physician, needs to be a pretty well-trained physician who's experienced with the types of challenges she's dealing with, needs to be in constant communication with their specialists, needs other embedded resources. They have a clinical pharmacist and a nutritionist uh, and a social worker embedded in their practice. And so that's a, that's a different model for a different type of person. And so if we think about different primary care models for different population segments, and there are probably five models in between those, then we have a very different vantage point on the workforce challenges that exist. We no longer need to say, a physician can take care of this many patients. How do we scale the number of primary care physicians linearly to meet the patient need? We could actually say a care team that looks like this can take care of this many patients who look like this. How do we lay that out and take care of 350 million people? It becomes a different problem than as you insert technology into it as well and tech enable more of those services. I think it, this the shortage we have in primary care physicians and in primary care more generally will hopefully be the catalyst that we need to rethink the primary care model broadly across the country. I think that moving to more value-oriented payment models is, is a huge opportunity in primary care. And I, I uh, before I was a CFO, I was a chief population health officer. I ran the population health operations at a large academic medical uh, center. I'm the chair of the board of America's Physician Groups, which is the largest industry association for risk-bearing physician groups that contract directly for risk. It's heavily primary care dominated. And these are primary care physicians who actually make a decent living and are able to you know, invest in what they need to in their practices and have a reasonable take home pay at the end of the day because they flipped from the idea of being kind of a, a transactional processor of visits to somebody who's managing a population. So if you think about the economics, if a primary care physician goes to work and bills their level two, level three e &M visits and sees 20 patients in a day for a hundred some dollars each. You, know, you can do that math and it's not that much money. It's only a few thousand dollars per physician per day. 
If instead you flip and you say, a primary care physician with a reasonable care team, let's say is the primary care team for a thousand patients and manages their entire total cost of care. So the average total cost of care per member per year for a health plan, if you average in commercial Medicare, Medicaid, is about $7,500. So if you started thinking about a primary care physician, not as somebody who bills $100 widgets, but manages a thousand patients at $7,500 each, that's a seven and a half million dollar P and L. Okay, so now you have to pay the hospital out of that, you have to pay for the drugs, you have to pay for the specialists. And capitation gets a bad rap from what happened in the 1990s. It's completely different now with better risk adjustment, with different sorts of support services, with better data that enables physicians to actually practice in a different way. But it starts to flip the conversation. So then morning huddle, when you know the practice gets together, you know, it's a it's a classic element of the patient centered medical home, you do a morning huddle. A morning huddle in a fee for service based practice, you think about Mrs. Smith, who's coming in first, and the 19 other patients who are coming in. If you were thinking about your 1,000 patients, you wouldn't talk about those 20. You'd think about who's not coming in. Should I get them in? Were they just discharged from the hospital? Do they need to see me tomorrow? Do I need to call them? If you stop thinking about billable services and instead think about managing that total cost of care, there, there is waste in there that can be gone after, but there's also opportunity from just the care being better that creates residual value. And in, in population health oriented payment models, that value disproportionately accrues back to the primary care physicians who are then able to reinvest that into their practices and, and again, make, make a reasonable living uh, relative to what happens in the fee for service model. I think that we're, if we're gonna address the clinician shortage, it'll need to be multifaceted. And I know it's a tired trope to say everything at top of license. There is an element of that and some of that is clinical, though I think the biggest not top of license activity that we have clinicians do is administrative work. I think technology can be a huge game changer there. Can we take 20, 30, 40% of the work off of a clinician's plate that is purely administrative? Some of the charting, right? With ambient documentation now, which we've deployed out and offered to all of our physicians, they're adopting, that takes away some of the charting time. That's great. Can we find a hundred other things that we can automate away to again, allow the clinician to be a clinician rather than a, you know, an administrative assistant and a scribe and a clinician and a prior auth processor all at once. So I think that's, that's one piece, technology. I think a second would be thinking about the clinical care teams, uh, you know, in terms of what does a care team look like for a given population? What needs to be physician work? What could be somebody else's work? Not just uh, an advanced practice professional like a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant, but you know, a nurse, a social worker, an MA, a health coach, a community health worker, what can be done by other people. And then we do need to make it more reasonable as a decision for young people in this country to become physicians. There was a time when it, it did make sense. The cost of medical school was not as exorbitant. The cost of undergraduate education was not as exorbitant. Residencies were a little shorter. Fellowships were less common. And physician pay relative to other pay was relatively higher. And so you could kind of draw a line that said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna spend this much time in undergraduate, then medical school, then training. I can make the math largely work. And we've broken that for a lot of specialties. We've broken it you know, largely for most of the clinician workforce. And that's not to say that physicians are extrinsically motivated. They're intrinsically motivated. That's why they do it anyway, right? They dedicate their lives to helping people despite the fact that it's financially penalizing. But if we could do some more things to make that easier. So I think, uh, you know, first loan reimbursement has become more and more common. I think that's great, especially in underserved areas. You know, organizations will say, we'll pay off your med school debt or a lot of it if you come and work in this rural area. I think that's great. I think free med school is the future. There are more and more medical schools that are going down that path, some really high brand, high reputation ones. NYU pushed on that first, uh, but both NYU and uh, you know then Einstein, who did it in New York as well, they both relied on philanthropy to do it. And I actually think that would be great. Look, let's get people who have means to endow med school for more and more people. I think that's amazing. It would be great if clinicians didn't need to have that trade-off of, I'm gonna take on so much debt in order to be able to practice my passion and help people. My, my brother and sister-in-law are both physicians. When they graduated from med school, they had a combined million dollars of debt between them. 
And then they wanted to start a family and get on with their lives. That's unfair. It's absolutely unfair to do that. Um, so yes, I think free med school is the future. I think figuring out ways to relieve the burden, the financial burden of undergraduate education for physicians as well, because that continues to go up. Uh, and then again, thinking about training pathways that allow people to get out there into the workforce more quickly is certainly something we can think about also combined with that idea of a broader care team. I think that AI, like any sort of technology, can be used for good or not for good. Um, we have a, a committee that looks at this that kind of includes our leading physicians and includes uh, some of our kind of medical ethicists, you know, to really think about how do we make sure we use AI as, as kind of a force for, for good. Uh, I do think that one of the fundamental economic problems we have in American healthcare is that it is reliant on people. And as the population ages, we're going to need more care of whatever type uh, per person because the people will be disproportionately older and need more care. And we're still gonna have this challenge where we're trying to keep healthcare costs more reasonably affordable. You know, healthcare as a percent of GDP skyrocketed through the 90s and the early 2000s. But what we often don't talk about is it was the same in 2023 as it was in 2009. We've largely flattened that. It was 17.6% in 2009, 17.8% in 2023. So just marginally higher. Gone are the days of healthcare is 1% more of GDP every year. So we've managed that. How are we going to manage that as the population ages? So as the cost of inputs go up, more labor, the cost will go up. And I think as a society, we have an opportunity to say, let's leverage technology in a completely different way. Let's think about labor technology substitution at scale, using AI, but also using other tools to enable people who are in the business of delivering care, physicians, nurses, others, to do more without asking them to work harder. Because I think most of the productivity gains that we've had in healthcare have actually just been forcing people to work harder for the same pay, which is not, that's not fundamentally sustainable. That's why burnout is such a problem amongst all clinicians. That's why we have physicians and nurses leaving the workforce. We collectively as a, as a society have made those jobs harder and harder and harder. I think there's an opportunity to leverage technology to actually make those jobs easier, as opposed to what's happened for the past 10 or 20 years when most of the technology we've deployed has actually made their jobs more administrative and harder. So we have to flip that technology debt around, repay it with dividends by transforming the way that we deliver care in a technology enabled way. Yes, leveraging AI and other solutions as much as possible and as appropriately as possible to help our people be better uh, and bring back some joy to practice as well. I'm really optimistic about the future of care delivery. Uh, and we talked about that a little bit on our panel and some of the insights of what could happen over not just one or two years, but five, 10, 15 years. The confluence of the macroeconomic environment and labor force shortages, and its necessity is the mother of invention. Those are going to create compression that we need to innovate our way out of. At the same time, we have new therapies coming to market at a faster rate than they've ever been before. We have new technology that could actually be game changing, I'd say for the first time in the history of healthcare. So the pressures, economics, labor, and the opportunities, the tools to innovate, science, technology, haven't come together in this combination before. So I think we're on the precipice of seeing true care delivery innovation and transformation at scale fast for the first time in the history of American medicine. And so I'm optimistic that we'll get there and that people who are at events like this will figure out how to innovate our way through uh, to add better value for all the patients that we need to serve.